Hi guys. Hi everyone. Welcome to the closing day for all deaf. Um, we're going to start off with a wonderful event um, called Seeing is Believing. How do you visualize the climate future? Um, we're going to start off this uh, wonderful conversation by a performance by Monty Manu, who's part of the band called Thala Watam. And um, they are, they recycle, reuse parts and they make music from that. And it just fits in very well to what the conversation is going to be about today, um, how we visualize the climate future and how important it is to, for us to recycle what we're kind of using in our everyday life. And to be able to create music out of that, that's just absolutely amazing. And um, so Montre is an absolutely amazing person. He's not going to be here with us, but he has sent us a video. And um, in, a, in a couple of minutes, we're going to see an amazing performance from him. Uh, he's based out of Austria and uh, he's been, he was born in India, in Cochin, but he is currently residing in Austria. And um, for him, Thala Watam is not like a band. It's an experience. It's a collaboration between artists. It's a collaboration between visual designers and musicians. And um, it's an absolutely amazing uh, performance. I, I saw him first on TEDx and I saw him and I was absolutely amazed by what he was able to produce. And um, so, yeah, we're going to start off this conversation by Montre's little video. So whenever we're ready, we're going to start with the video. Manuel. I was born and raised in Cochin. In 2002, I decided to move in to Bangalore. And I was a drummer for Saratma for seven years. In 2011, I decided to leave the band and start my project called Talawatam, which means a circle of rhythm. And we upcycle music instruments. about 15 to 20 music instruments out of found objects and uh, a few of my favorites are tubla which is created out of uh, discarded pvc pipes
main idea behind the project is that clean the environment through music. All right. I think um, in this age of technology, internet's still not with us all the time. Um, but it's such a wonderful um, little performance that um, Monterey did. And it's such an amazing thing because you can create music from anything practically. And that's an amazing thing. Hi. Sorry, we just dropped off. Did that happen for you as well? Yeah. All right, we should be all good now. Sorry, internet. <laughs> Go That's for it. Great. Um, so we're going to start off the conversation by introducing our lovely panelists for today. Um, we have Swabu Kohli, we have Upmanyu Bhattacharya, and we have Kal also who work with uh, Upmanyu at uh, for Wade. Uh, unfortunately, Shruti won't be able to join us because she's feeling a little under the weather. And um, in these corona times, it's obviously better to rest a little bit than to um, exert yourself. So I'm going to start off by giving every one of our panelists a couple of minutes to introduce themselves, share their experiences, where they're coming from. So I'd like to start with um, Upmanyu. Um, <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Upamanyu. I'm one of the co-directors of Wade alongside Kalp and uh, I'm an animator and illustrator based in Kolkata. Currently, Wade was our uh, first animated short film uh, as, a, as a director. Uh, it was our first film that we were putting out and we're very happy that it screened at all deaf. And yeah, just generally very happy to be here. I mean, uh, hi, uh, Swabu, we haven't met before, but like I've, uh, I think sometime back in 2015 or something, there was some TEDx in Bangalore and we, there was oh, yes. a group of people who'd made artwork for it and he'd made this amazing turtle, which had this whole universe on its back, which was really cool. So it's good to meet you, you in person as well. So, <laughs> in person, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kalp, can you also give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Uh, so I think you're on mute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So I'm again, I'm Kalp based in Kolkata, uh, co directors of co director of Wade alongside Upamanyu, like you said. And uh, I've been, uh, we've been, here for the past uh, around four years now in Kolkata uh, and we sort of uh, co-founded Ghost, that's our studio, which we work in currently. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really, really happy with how, uh, how Wade is doing and so happy it's screened that alt, alt F also. And um, uh, I have also an animator illustrator. We've I've graduated from NID Ahmedabad in 2016 and been freelancing ever since. And again, co-founded Ghost with Upamanyu. We've actually been working together since a very, very long time, almost since 2012, 13, since college <laughs> itself, yeah. And it's been great, it's been great. Uh, and I think we'll keep working together and many more projects <laughs> to come. 
uh yeah hi swabhu again haven't met you before Hello. so <laughs> really want to see your work <laughs> yeah all right before we move on to swabhu we'll show the trailer for wade um so that the audience can get a little glimpse of how amazing this movie is so um whenever you're ready absolutely amazing still gives me goosebumps the animation this yeah, is absolutely stunning guys <laughs> uh we do apologize uh, if the video quality wasn't amazing the internet it wasn't bad it was actually good i got good yeah i did i think it was good and it was fine yeah but uh those who are joining us for the event can definitely catch the trailer on our instagram page and um, it's an amazing movie definitely buy the pass for this um definitely support these artists because they're doing such good work okay so now i think we're going to start the discussion i'm very excited about this because um this is something that i've been dealing with for all my life now it's been 10 years since i've started becoming interested in the environment and i've been experiencing climate grief for about 9 and a half years out of those 10 so i'm not really optimistic about these things but i'd like to start off by um asking you guys what do you think about what climate grief is and how you kind of deal with it and why you've chosen your why kalp and upmani have chosen animation as their mode to express that and why eventually uh, swabhu's used the visual storytelling medium to kind of express that so let's start off uh, with kalp come on um what do you think about climate grief uh yeah so uh, for me uh, and for us uh, way it was something that we uh, sort of started after obviously both of us graduated and uh, us we both have grown up in kolkata uh, my voice is coming right yeah so uh, mm-hmm. after having grown up in kolkata we sort of after graduating we came back to our city because we we both trained in animation 2d animation and film making uh, from nid so we really wanted to sort of make our own film and uh, coming back to the city we thought that something we really wanted to do about our city that we've grown up in and uh, both of us sort of uh, came across uh, this sort of disturbing article about uh, the river islands in the sundarbans uh, the goramara islands which are sort of drowning and hundreds and thousands of people have been sort of uh, removed from their homes and uh, uh seeing that uh it it scared us a little more because uh these islands are very close to kolkata they are just sort of south of the city uh about 70 to 80 kilometers 
and uh, climate change is obviously happening and the sea levels are rising and if i mean it's it's going to continue and kolkata will be next so we being the residents of the city uh, are going to have the same effect and we will be homeless i mean we will have to move out of the city once the city is underwater and that sort of scared us and out of that i think this film was born uh, and um, that is something uh, sort of inspired us but also sort of made us feel that something needs to happen about this and us being filmmakers and animators i think making a film was something we were we were i think good at and decided to sort of go for it and uh, i think uh, dealing with a uh, uh, city like kolkata like many other cities in in our country uh, uh, the resources are not as much as the population can sort of uh, the population is is, is not going to stop it's growing and the resources cannot support it and at some point uh, it's it's sort of almost reached the saturation and at some point it's going to crumble and with climate change coming in it's not going to be able to sort of take it so that is something we've also brought into our film and uh, sort of just try to f- figure out what our city would look like once the climate change is going to sort of strike our city like many other cities not just in india everywhere actually um, just like the sundarbans there are a lot of other towns and a lot of other coastal cities which have already the people there have had to move and are homeless so it's happening everywhere and even if although we based it in very very local in in our city it's i think it's relatable everywhere i feel so that's something we were going for and um, yeah i think that's how at least our film began and we sort of got in depth we read a lot of papers a lot of books and did our research as much as we could and try to be true to what we sort of wanted to portray especially for the people of our city and the people that were affected that are the people of the sundarban right awesome that's uh, that sounds um, amazing that's a great journey to go through i think um i think i'm going to steer the conversation towards swabu i think i forgot to get your introduction in after we i think i was too mesh mesmer okay. the trailer uh swabu i'm so sorry for that please um, give no, us no no that's for the audience and um, also explain to us what you feel about climate change and how you deal with it first of all thank you for having me uh, i'm a visual artist i've been based in goa now since the last past 7 years uh, a lot of the work i do revolves around my studies and research around our relationship with the ecology and in india especially i think all of us I, it, it's very close to like what Kalp was saying, you know, like all the cities we have lived in were once very close to natural environments. And, and as a country, we live very close to nature in one way or another. And slowly that relationship is deteriorating and uh, that slowly is actually becoming really, really fast. And through my journey, I have been, uh, as a visual artist, I've been exploring how I can sort of uh, create those connections again whether that's through film animation illustration projection mapping installation basically create interactive spaces where one can come and learn about these spaces again and initially it came from a space of fantasy and um, a space of like absolute beauty and magic and over time i started realizing that um, there are a lot of links missing of how much we have learned about our ecology and i'm going to tie this into what you're talking about climate grief because i feel like somewhere uh, there are so many interconnections between how we've never really studied about the land to be grown up on in terms of i mean india's got so many habitats it's got so many types of species we have so many weather patterns i mean it's it's quite a neglected bunch so for us to be not knowing anything about it within the schooling system was quite unfortunate and i think uh, that's also been one of the main reasons why we have lost so many things without even knowing what we've lost and somewhere through my work i've been trying to capture those stories through collective memory through my interactions with different naturalists or from researchers and sort of navigated through that and uh, coming to climate change uh, it's a very similar story actually i was born and raised in new delhi for the first 17 18 years of my life and we used to farm there so you know like it was a city where like now where gurgaon stands there used to be agricultural lands and you know we used to have meal guys jackals fireflies we had everything and we saw it all just vanish 
in like a matter of 10 years, once the mining and, 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 and the new cities came up, cut to I come to Bangalore and I was living on the outskirts and I sort of was reconnected to what the Delhi I used to look like lived in, uh, that I lived in used to look like. And I was like, oh my gosh, I really miss this. And by the fourth year of graduating from Srishti, there was a giant billboard between Yalahanka and uh, Bangalore City that said Yalahanka New Town is in New Gurgaon. And that kind of shook me because I was like, oh my God, so this is going to happen. I know how this goes. I've seen there, been there, done that. I know what this is going to look like. Right. And then after a lot of search searching, I moved to Goa. And after a few years of living here, the same plans started creeping up. And that's when I realized that, you know, this idea of um, nature, conservation, it cannot stay in a room, like the politics of nature and the politics of conservation, it cannot just be locked in a room where only scientists and researchers and our politicians can be involved. Citizens play such an active um, part in uh, like, it, like especially in a, uh, in a democratic process. I mean, we have rights towards these things. So without that sense of knowledge and without that sense of, um, first of all, we don't even know what we're protecting. So how do we create, you know, there's so many missing blanks. And through my practice now also as a key player in the armchair more like campaign in Goa, this is exactly what we've been trying to plug in is using art tools to sort of uh, deeper understand A, the conflicts that come from others that are looming over all our protected spaces, not just within Goa, but all across India now. So that's just a, a little bubble of where I come from and I guess how I feel about the situation we're in. You know, that's, uh, that's so true because I'm even I'm from Delhi and I lived there for 18, 19 years myself. Then I moved out um, eight years and then I came back mm -hmm. last year. And with this whole, uh, and I started working for an organization that was working towards clean in it. And I just saw the state of what Delhi was when I left and what it became after I'd come back. It really shook me too. And, and, and Delhi is just one city out of so many cities in India which are suffering from various kinds of mm -hmm. environmental degradation. It's just not air pollution, it's water pollution, it's land pollution, it's so many things. And it's so important to kind of have um, artists come into play and kind of express that in a sense which people can kind of relate to because scientific information is so difficult to kind of understand for everyone because if it's not your specialization, then you're just stuck with that in that sense. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, Upmanyu what he thinks about climate grief. This is a personal question, so feel free to express yourself as much as you can. Yeah, I mean, uh, how do I put this? I mean, I am a filmmaker first and foremost. It's not like I, uh, that, that is my training. It's not, uh, I am an urban child. I've grown up in the city. I don't have, uh, I, I can't call the issue of, you know, watching a place deteriorate my own, like let's say Swabhu can in that sense. But uh, if you look into the history of Kolkata, just a few years before, again, it's the same story everywhere. Like uh, just about a kilometer that way, you still have ruins of a tiger hunting bungalow. So, I mean, we did beat back the forests for the cities that we made. And where I come into it, in particular with my curiosities as a filmmaker, I think are, is how people behave around such things. Now, in... In Wade, if you've seen the film, it's it's not uh, it's not like you know it's not submerged to a four-story, five-story level or anything. So there's nothing inherently unlivable about such a space because we know that other people can live in such ways. But what does interest me is, as with any crisis, what does it do to people, especially in large numbers? That's something. Uh, so if, I mean, we have grown up with an unprecedented amount of awareness around climate change as well. Uh, you know, uh, an inconvenient truth got an Oscar. Al Gore ran for wife, like he ran for president, and then we had the climate strikes in the last few years. Uh, I think we were the first and last batch to have environmental science as a compulsory subject in ISC. Uh, so we we've had exposure in bits and pieces, yeah. uh, but I don't think any of it affects you to the point of view of uh, you know looking a little forward and thinking, okay, how do, what kind of a person do I become? on the other side of this and with any crisis like in the pandemic for every act of uh, you know selflessness or uh, you know someone going out to the front line even if they didn't have to volunteering the help you also had people throwing doctors out of their houses on suspicion uh, throwing stones at funeral processions so i think crisis brings out a lot of interesting things about people and when you're bracing for something as large and global as climate change 
uh, it doesn't necessarily have to end up becoming a disaster situation for all of us is where i come into this issue from but unless we condition ourselves a certain way unless we're uh, willing to think about people a certain way especially people who don't belong to where we belong uh, people who aren't from the same places that we are don't come from the same uh, situations that we do that's when things get a little complicated that's when you're not as conditioned and or as uh, primed to handle such a situation like climate change would end up being and mainly for me that's what weight is about it's it's not about uh, you know visualizing a flooded city that's easy enough to do uh, it's a, it's about what kind of things do people end up doing on the other side of such a thing and even if let's say we are faced with the inevitability of climate change it doesn't necessarily have to end society as we know it because society as we know it is really young that way we have we have been through way more before the cities as we know it now or the social structures as we know it now or the countries as we know it now all of these things are very new ideas given the amount of history we have lived through as a species so that's that's where i was coming into weight from that those were the curiosities i had right i just such an interesting point that you say that um we get bits and pieces of information of the about the environment crisis and we don't get the full picture and sometimes it skews our idea of what's going to happen in the future and you're correct like it might not result in a catastrophic uh problem but it might just we might kind of like be able to live with what's going to happen and just kind of merge into this new kind of a reality and this kind of like brings me into my next question which is that um there is i think like when we when we talk about like melting glaciers or rise of sea levels is such a it's so you can't really see it and it's such a difficult thing to figure out whether it's actually happening or it's not happening and where do you think the visual medium comes into expressing this um expressing small changes which might have huge impact for our future as humanity and uh where do you think all of this comes into play into your own art and into your own way of expressing uh through the visual medium uh, uh anyone can go for it uh whoever wants to like answer this question um i'm okay with anyone all of these answers have been wonderful um so i can sort of begin with like say what we've been doing. i mean so the glaciers are still like far from us right so like i'm saying like you know this is the thing you know when we look at climate change you're always thinking of the larger picture which is of course sea rise which is one of the most crucial aspects but there are these other uh, the ideas also to understand the interconnectivity of us and our ecology because everything from your forest to your rivers to the the glaciers all the way there we are all interconnected within an ecosystem and say if you look at like issues mo- much more closer to home like the western ghats have been being infiltrated with like different development projects mining projects railway projects since like the past few years in fact kerala had got enough warnings in time that you know flooding will happen with the kind of uh, projects that are being passed through it and it's the same thing is happening even with goa i mean we've been getting enough warning signals since the last 5 years that you know with the kind of infiltration we are pushing into the ghats uh it could and particularly like when we uh, i have to come back to this conversation because you were saying that how like i personally feel like at least the east and looking at india it is going to be a very catastrophic situation if climate change pulls through i don't think it's going to be a very small picture because people like you and me aren't really dependent on the ecology you know like we still live within our homes and we're still distant away from this narrative but if you look at the agrarian economy which is like particularly in india it's largely rainfall dependent it's largely uh, so where does this rainfall come from it comes from the western ghats so any change in this and that's technically the larger pop, the, the, the larger chunk of this country right also some of the most populated cities of the east line near the coast even in india like if you look at it i mean just the population density of a calcutta or a bombay so if a calcutta shrinks or or submerges down the water or if a bombay submerges down the water the kind of population displacement that's going to cause is enormous and so you know we have to look at uh, i think the narratives are also figuring out what is close to us so say for example like with goa like with these projects that have been passed you know like it seems like oh it's just another uh, highway expansion it's just another river expansion what does this play in the larger picture but this is exactly where i feel the role of artists can come in very interestingly because 
scientists keep telling us repeatedly and not just scientists even uh, i have to bring this up because it's also our communities that have been living with the, with with nature so many tribal communities so many indigenous communities they are so in tune with uh, with their ecology and with knowing i mean nobody knows a forest better than them even a scientist won't know as much as what's happening than them and we've got enough warning signals from them but all this information is sort of like trapped lost in a different language and it's not reaching us and this is exactly where art like artists like and, and, and i think weir is a fantastic example of that because so many times when you, when we're making this campaign i'll give you a small example when uh, this these three projects had passed through and uh, i put out a call out as part of the campaign saying what are your memories of a forest and how do these landscapes shape you how are they part of your your identity and some of the artworks i mean we got of course a range of fantastic artwork that came in part of the campaign but there were also little, little artworks that came by children had drawn zebras they had drawn giraffes they had drawn like you know and not these are not species that we have seen around us where have they got this recognition from so it's because of the kind of visual culture we consume and because there is such little representation of our own habitats of our own ecosystems of our own relationships also looking at the forest as this pristine a uh, piece of land which has no human infiltration is also entirely flawed because a country like india that does not exist it's a very colonial view of looking at how you look at a forest because whether you look at the sundarbans you look at the western ghats they all are managed by so many tribal communities they share ecosystems even a city like bombay has a thriving leopard population you know like so i mean we are we're so close to wild beasts we're so close to so many things so i guess understanding how nature is also ad- like evolving and and adapting to how we are changing our cities is equally important and then figuring out the larger picture i think will be because if you just present the larger picture it seems like so far off and it always seems like a larger burden and you don't know how to like get involved in this narrative but when you look at the things happening much more closer to home they are the ones actually causing the larger melting of the glaciers right is because of these projects being passed here and the carbon footprint expanding here there's that massive thing happening there so i feel like taking baby steps and the baby steps are the ones that are much closer to home and in the country like india we see it happening at such a rapid speed particularly because our population density is it's insane it's incredibly high and yet we have some of the most biodiverse spaces in the world we have two of the biggest uh, i mean the eighth and the, uh, the eighth biodiversity hot, uh, hotspot is in india which is the western ghats and the himalayas boat so you know there's so much close to us and we need to start i think taking the steps to learn about what is around us first and then possibly reach solutions of how to fix it because many times we might re- reach our solutions before knowing what we are dealing with and that in itself can be a very damaging process you know where we go like oh this cancer this this but we actually might not know the anything about the ecology yeah. so yeah if i made any sense to yeah. everyone because these topics are so large you know they just pull you into a whirlpool of knowledge <laughs> and information <laughs> Yeah, no. I want you to be in a world full of information. Um, it's, it's go through that process in itself. Um, it's it's so fascinating that you uh, say that we're so close to nature, but yet we're not. We're so separated. Like um, I think I saw a TV show and it said there's like an aspect of nature away from nature in a sense. Uh, we mm-hmm. look at look at ourselves as as our consciousness as a thing that separates us from nature, but it's not true at all. and i think wade does this very well in which it really puts the human community in up close with the the wild population of tigers and kalp if you can come in and um, explain why that sort of conflict between the tigers and the the humans living in kolkata was such a important aspect of the film and how that through the visual medium was so important for you to show yeah uh, so i mean the people of the sundarban have are still living in very very close contact with the tigers uh, every single day uh, they go into the forest to collect firewood and lot of other resources and they come across tigers every time so uh, that's something has been uh, this tiger human conflict has been happening for generations and years and like i think decades so uh, like i like i mentioned earlier uh, when uh, what we've tried to show in the film when the sundarbans are sort of uh, gonna be under water and the sea level keeps rising uh the only way for them whoever's living is going to be northwards and that's going to be and kolkata is going to be directly in their path so they are going to migrate upwards and uh, again people in kolkata once this happens uh, people who uh, can afford to sort of leave and go 
higher they're going to leave but the people who cannot and again uh, this entire climate change situation it has happened because uh, i think larger and richer countries are just spoiling it for the poorer countries which are not contributing as much as the others similar situation over here where the, the villagers and the people from the sundarbans have not contributed to climate change and they are going to suffer the most and they will move into the city and they will have to sort of scavenge and move around in such a situation and the animals will also and that is something we 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 brought into the film as well where the entire <clears throat> ecology of the sundarban has now just been sort of shifted to the city uh without a, obviously that's that's not their choice but they've been forced to do that and that's something we uh we sort of went around the city and figured out how we could uh do this best and sort of took a lot of pictures we in fact the the entire film that happens uh, on park street which is sort of like the the whole commercial hub and the center of the city where people go and chill there are tons of restaurants and that's where we also sort of sat in one of the cafes and worked on a major part of the film and figured that that's this is something we want to do where um uh, and such a happy place but it's it's it'll be sad if the city goes through this and it's it's going to be it's just waiting for the we're just waiting for the city to sort of go under and uh, again in a lot of films uh, th- there this huge i don't know cgi tsunamis has come and wipes away the city that's not really going to happen like upaman you said it's not going to be like a huge devastation it's slowly creeping into our cities and our lives we sort of know it but we ignore it or we don't know it or people just deny it <laughs> and uh, it but it's happening and there are real data there are real articles real like people are doing their research and it's happening but yeah i mean we don't talk about it and i'm glad we are doing this right now and whoever is watching this can also have their own conversations about this but this is something we again thought of uh, again us as filmmakers uh, like scientists will do their research writers will write we made a film and this is something we thought would help to sort of stir a conversation because we went over the country to tour as a tour to sort of screen our films with a bunch of other films and we also did it in calcutta and uh, when we showed them our film we they really connected to it and they were scared they were scared because it was very real and again human behavior is something i think every filmmaker studies and sort of gets into and studies that in details because like over when you mentioned again earlier human behavior and how they will react to such a situation is something which is very very interesting and which matters uh by the end of it it's uh, again like swabu said the entire huge migration that's going to happen when once people are displaced similar thing over here uh we've put in these little hints and details in the film if you if you saw in the backdrop or the or the wall art or whatever uh where there's there, there was a huge backlash and the people did not want the environmental refugees so we were sort of building on to that from the beginning and then finally they are they have no choice and people have left and whoever's back is scavenging around in the city so uh, yeah so this was the uh, idea behind what we sort of the universe we set up around the real city and what would be and we also sort of after doing uh, after making this art and making the city like it is we were glad that we read a bunch of books and this is what will re- actually happen so that was something sort of we thought that yeah we we've touched the right uh, i don't know what to say uh, the right angle to this and this is very very real especially yeah. when uh, sorry uh, when uh, the amfam cyclone happened that's something happened much later of course after the film was made but that was when the lockdown was on in the city and the city was devastated because of the cyclone and the pictures that we saw from the city was so similar to the film that that like a lot of people sort of wrote to us saying yeah this is happening and it will happen so yeah it's very interesting that you uh, that's a very interesting answer because you also touched upon uh, global politics in this and how the rich countries are kind of have done this industrialization process and have really messed up the environment in a way 
And it's very really interesting because I, uh, uh, the director of the organization that I work at, she uh, did that interview with Leonardo DiCaprio when he was making that movie before the floods or after the floods, I'm forgetting. But he comes in and he says that, um, you know, like population crisis is going to be a big issue in the environment. And she shuts him down and says that, you know, it's not the population that's the problem. It's your industrialization, your levels of industrialization that are a problem. And um, it's, it's very fascinating that you also bring up the frame of mind that people are in when they look at the environmental crisis. And I'd, I'd like to go to Manu right now and um, ask him what he thinks uh, is important. Like, how do you change the frame of mind? Because people are usually in a, you know, oh, climate change is not happening. And it's not a thing exactly. that doesn't exist. Yeah, because, because that's the thing. You may have a lot of indigenous uh, knowledge. You may have a lot of scientific knowledge. But regardless of how much information you have, all of this plays into some sort of a belief system or another, whether it's COVID, you will have a lot of people supporting the science. You will also have a lot of people calling it a hoax, buying into different. And the reason they do that is because from the information to reach everyone else, there is communication along the way. And that's where it takes the shape of art, articles, writing, TV shows, talk shows, memes. That's, that's how it gets out there uh, in, in that sense. So what we're doing is really, we're just trying to add to a certain kind of communication in that sense. And like we said, what our concern mainly was is that, yes, uh, let's say you do have a lot of indigenous wisdom about uh, how to mitigate certain effects of climate change. Is that reaching everyone and does everyone even agree on it? So even if you have a lot of good information, if you have a lot of good wisdom, even obvious wisdom, it may not be of any use to anyone unless it's reaching you know, people in large numbers because currently most of the world operates on the basis of majority opinion. And if you have a majority of people subscribing to the fact that, no, in order for my life to improve, I need a road and I need to go from point A to point B and I need a job and to buy food and not grow it. And to buy food, I need to work at a petrochemical plant and I need petrol in my car. The more, if you, the problem is we built a world like that where people are finding it a little difficult to tune out mm. instantly. So it is It is not as simplistic as saying that, uh, especially for city people, it's very easy to go in and tell, you know, so people in the Sundarbans right now that, hey, you're not supposed to go into the forest and get honey, uh, leave the forest alone. But what do we know <laughs> in that sense? So a, long, a, a lot of what we do is also finding that balance of when to talk, when to listen, uh, just, and even between people as well to have that thing that okay maybe we don't have all the information we should listen a little more if someone doesn't believe in uh, what you're saying there's a there's a way to have that conversation and that's where everything ties into the political uh, climate that we're currently growing up in as well in that sense where it's very difficult to have a conversation it's very difficult to uh, have an opinion without being called the other in some way so, and that's where it comes into issues like migration. So some things Swabu mentioned earlier that yes, that you will have a lot of migration if cities start going underwater, but what if you had different views on migration as a majority, as a majority, you, you decide that okay, spaces are more to be shared. If you build spaces that are more to be shared and decentralized from the idea of, okay, this is private space. This is my area. This is my boundary. This is. So I, I think those things, because they're such young ideas, they are subject to change, especially uh, the way we build buildings, the way we build cities. I, I'm, that's, that's what I'm saying. It need not be, yes, it is very bad to have a lot of storms coming into your city. It's bad for the city to flood. It's bad for the grid to go down. It's bad for farmland to go underwater. All of this, like whether you agree with it or not, it may even end up being inevitable. But does that have to end everything for us when it does end up happening is the question that, uh, something like we would like to ask you and get get your opinion on in that sense. It's not about what I believe, but it's about what, uh, like having engaged with the film, what you end up coming up with. Do you think that, okay, we could potentially build a city where we will survive this together? Or will you stand up and say, no, this is, uh, you know, this is an impossibility. The people had better stay out. You know, people who live in the city. They... So once you start talking a little bit more, you may have a better idea of what, other people where other people are on it and that very much matters considering it's not going to affect us on an individual basis mm. it's a it's a very interesting point you raise because um there's you have a framework in which people are functioning in which they they have the tendency to deny all climate change because of the current systems and structures that are in place 
and then you have people who understand all of this and they are in this tragic kind of a mind stream in which they understand all of these problems but they they have they just resign to the fact that it's going to happen that the sense of responsibility reduces and so i would like you come in and explain how um, people who are facing this kind of a like a framework of uh, thinking can like actually utilize that energy into maybe climate activism or maybe doing some level of art that can help them relieve this kind of uh, grief that they're facing so i think uh, you know it's it actually is like i tell you something like a simple talk you know like uh, usually when i start this conversation i've always heard of like an era like people will talk of the bangalore in the 90s they talk about delhi in the 80s they talk about you know like this or it is always in the past and of course the halo of the past always keeps increasing as time keeps passing but the one thing that i do notice in most of these conversation is that you know that our lifestyles did include some level of proximity to the outdoors you know whether it was like how people remember the bangalore weather or how they miss the delhi winter which is now completely smog ridden or how they miss you know like they 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 these very little little tiny details and a lot of it always ties down to somewhere something to do with nature and uh, i think so the first thing that i would suggest is you know like for anybody who is sort of in this anxious space also is first go out even whether you're on your balcony in a city or whether you're out somewhere start observing you know because like say like i'll give you an example a city like delhi which is one of the most polluted cities that we have in the world right now has one of the most thriving birding populations you know like the kind of birds you see in that city is incredible so you know here is a sign of nature like i mean birds are still returning there to you know um to breed and somewhere that really stuck with me because i was like oh my gosh why are they even coming back because so many birds change paths so yeah. you know this is ex- like this is exactly why i come back to to saying that you know humans and uh like different species and and, and nature have had this relationship so try and build that relationship again and i think observation is one of the most beautiful things that we can we, that we can actually master as a skill because like i remember like i was living in ishim goa for for a few years and i was like oh my god there's so many birds here and I, and i got into birding and as soon as i came back to delhi for summer i started spotting like way many more birds only because i was seeing them like they were always there but i never took the effort to actually just seeing what all is happening because i was like oh my god what could be in this forbidden city where you know there's it's so polluted it's so tragic but that's what i've actually started realizing that you know there's these so many and the minute we recognize these tiny little things we create hope for pushing someone's existence like i'll tell you a small example like you know we used to have lot of sparrows in delhi and i started noticing that why are the sparrows gone why have all the small sand birds gone and a large part of why they were missing was because a lot of the flowering plants that 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 they used to host on were absent so i was like okay what can we do so i planted a madhumalti creeper i don't even have a garden space up in delhi because its land is so cramped so we took the front the 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 community garden put the creepers there and i tied them all the way up to my roof so the creepers started growing from the front garden all the way up to my floor and now it's like it's this huge like gigantic creeper that goes all the way up to three floors but suddenly the minute that came in we had sparrows back we had sunbirds back we had honey bees coming in and then when my neighbors started seeing that they were like oh that's a pretty genius idea why don't i try something so you know the the best solutions are sometimes really easy yeah. and they and they can be unlocked truly through the key of observation because i know that like the, like, like the more we try with complicated solutions and things like that we, we always get lost so i think before reaching uh like the end product of something that we were going to make i think first and foremost it's like try and build the stamina to observe because there's so much that ends up happening in that and a chance of survival almost comes about from that like also engaging with the political fabric of how the current politics is seeing ecology that is something that i think as indians we it 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 should be like it's, it's something that should be made compulsory because whether we look at our riverways whether we look at our forests whether we look at our seas they all are being looked looked at as a source of monetizing the economy and of course when we are looking at monetizing the economy we also have to look at the impact of that monetization and i think it's very important to engage with that uh with those learnings because without that we are not living in the real world 
you know, we could come up with these tiny solutions. Like you could go and clean a beach up every day and put all the plastic. But where is that plastic going? If it's, if it's going back in the landfill, I mean, it's great effort, but we need more at this point because the kind of crisis we're in, it's not really the smartest solution we can come at. And, and, and I'm not saying we shouldn't go for beach cleanups. I mean, of course we should, but I'm just saying we have to push our, um, our ability to learn at this point, particularly because the generation that we are, we are at this very strange tipping point, you know, where a lot of things could, I mean, the work that we're doing will become three times harder if we don't think smart at this point in time. So they're almost like really good cheat codes. And like, I'll give you like an example of the Amcha Mulla campaign. So we divided the campaign into three parts, which was the first was hope. Like first you build hope. And that's where your stories of beauty and the stories of, you know, just the beautiful artwork goes a long way. So even if you're somebody who doesn't want to engage in say the larger politics, get involved with a community that is fighting for the ecology around you because for, for anyone to take a battle on is, is quite hard. But in every state, there's some community, there's some group of people who are fighting for some part of that ecology. Like you look at the Arab Biodiversity Park in Delhi. I'm sure Bombay has so many uh, projects happening. So use your skills. And that's exactly what we did with the Amche Mole campaign that we opened a pool of skill sets for people to get involved. So you don't have to like, go crazy. Sometimes it's just, you can write a poem, you could write a song, you could make an artwork and allow it to become a voice for some larger movement that's, you know, that's coming together to fight the politics of why that land is being grabbed. And it does have a beautiful effect because like with so many of our artworks that came in, they were actually gifted to MLAs up in Goa. So they actually were witnessing a surge of artworks coming in. And, and at the end of the day, what does art do? It, it creates a point of access versus then just seeing that we don't want this they're going like why are we saying we don't want this you know there is an emotional connection to this place there are uh, scientific connections to this place there are like indigenous connections to this place so you know it becomes it becomes a deeper voice and i think it does go a long way at least that's what we've seen with the movement that we're currently a part of uh, when we started with four people in a room and suddenly have over 100 volunteers everybody pulling in their hours it's incredible. You know, one doesn't expect it, but it does go a long way. No, absolutely. That's so correct. And like, we have to negotiate our um, terms with nature, I think, and we haven't done them properly, I think. And we do need resources, but when if we're going to exploit these resources, we need to be like, okay, like this is the maximum extent to which we're going to do it and mm -hmm. kind of control our consumption and our structures around that. Uh, it's, it's such a, it's such a fascinating conversation. I'm just, so sad that it's gonna it's coming to an end right now and uh, i'll have to bring in the audience questions because there are some absolutely great questions and there are a bunch of questions for everyone so uh, get ready um so the first question that i have is uh as strong visual storytellers how do you all find balance between relying on the visual versus the story or do you rely on both? What do you think plays that key role in getting the message across to your audiences? And what really hooks them to your work? Um, anyone can go for it. Whoever feels comfortable speaking first can start off. Uh, if you want me to repeat the question, I can do that too. It's, a, it's something we, one always struggles with that way. Do you, uh, uh, like, obviously, as an artist, you also want to keep making things but like you have a personal journey with your art as well so obviously at all points you're trying to make art that is expressing whatever you want better in a way sometimes you also it, it is natural to get caught up in things like skill in terms of technicality in terms of is my cinematography excellent is my all of that stuff but uh, once once you I, I think once you come into it from a space of humility where especially for me I think uh, there will always be a better drafts person there will always be a better uh, let's say cinematographer, a better animator, character animator, but what is it that I can bring? So what I can bring is my concern in, in that sense. Like I can bring a point of view, I can bring, uh, that is stuff that someone else cannot bring, but what I can do is I can enable collaborations and you know, bring the right people for everything that I mentioned earlier, someone who's really good at something to make them share in that uh, idea. So for something like Wade, where the concern is, clearly very overarching in the sense like it is it is looking very solidly towards the future asking questions raising fears even like personal deep dark fears that both of us directors have uh, 
I th- I think that kind of permeates into every decision that we make after a point. If we start, if we think about it from that point of view enough, uh, without which it would just you know one can make some excellent renders of a of a flooded city. The end. But what was what was really scaring us? Not wasn't the fact that we live in proximity with tigers, but that people would start doing terrible things to each other in such a in such a space. So because that. that was the overarching fear through everything it finds its way into form always and i think like that's what art practice usually ends up doing it just bridges that gap between intent and form over time so you end up making things that hit the point uh, better with the more practice that you end up having to so yeah hope that answers the question <laughs> it does it does wonderfully uh... so i'm going to move on to the next question because there's a couple of really good questions that i want to ask everyone so uh, we have enough time for doing all of this um so kalp uh, uh, this question uh, i'm going to ask you uh, do you feel like mainstream art has the power to breed apathy just as your art has the power to spark change um how do we combat this in a sense uh, i think um yeah any any art um uh how do i say this uh <laughs> i mean i don't know i mean weird is obviously not mainstream and it's not a commercial uh film as such and uh, i'm glad it's doing well in a bunch of festivals but uh um uh, i think any art which connects uh to people and relates will do well uh especially say if if we are dealing with something to do with climate change and the environment right now uh if you sort of uh look at what's happening a lot of what uh, swabhu said like if you observe and if you sort of get that get your observation into your art and you translate it well into a, a surface or or anything not just a drawing but a poem or anything a story like he said uh that will connect uh to the audience uh and uh, uh about mainstream i i am not sure how to say that but again just as in terms of pure art and pure uh, just <clears throat> uh translation of ideas onto a surface or any medium uh, uh like i mentioned before if you understand human behavior and what uh, upaman you also said that if you know if you if you uh, empathize or if you are in, in that position uh say if you are in close proximity to a, a tiger you will obviously you're going to be scared but the the whole picture for us again like he said was what what people will do or what they're going to do to each other uh, and there are a, a bunch of uh, scenes in the film where even we were sort of scared to animate and put in the film where uh, where uh, i don't want to spoil the film but where some where where people will do horrible things to each other and it's a matter of life and death so once you once you study that once you study human behavior in such stressful and such a like a pressure filled environment and translate that i think people will relate to that and connect so uh, yeah just be true great. to that i guess yeah. and that's a great answer um this is going to be the final question and i want to address it to swabhu cuz i feel like uh from this space i want to move on to how people can actually strengthen campaigns like the amchi molam campaigns and so we have a question uh, for you swabhu which is what advice do you have for young artists who want to use their art to strengthen campaigns like the amchi molam campaign or the dibang valley campaign and how do they break into this space because it's such a difficult space to break into sometimes because you're just stuck in a job or stuck in a specific city and you want to go help and start campaigning how do what advice do you have for young artists like that so uh speaking of both these campaigns i think what's incredible about these campaigns is that they're very ex- very accessible and uh, both arms and the, the the bang movement i think they were successful entirely because of this because they're very you can literally just write in an email and like say I'll, like i'll give an example of amcha mora because we've been arcading the department over there so a beautiful way how we work is that you know whenever you're free because these campaigns are not for two weeks or three weeks or three months or four months these are long fights they're going to last for at least three years four years and one of the main things to understand about when you're stepping into any of these conversations is that you're not going to get immediate results so how do you keep the stamina to keep going at this conversation for a long time and it's it's not a paid job it's clearly a volunteer based thing so 
it's best to approach these spaces when you know how much time you know you can give so say for example we had people writing to us saying i have three days off i have a weekend off tell me what to do and you know we so you can help as basic as making a poster or making a little uh, like a little um, you know like update for the campaign or sometimes people have more hours and they go like you know i have i'm available for six months but i but i'm running a job so then we usually pass very dense scientific papers and then we let the people read through it and then you know because there's no deliverable as such because when you're fighting such a long fight you can have outcomes at any point the point is that it's nice that people are getting involved at different different parts in life so i think if you're interested in getting involved in this space get in touch with these people and most of the people in this campaign actually need help from every every angle so you know whether you have a day or you have a, a whole year to give they'll be happy for any form of service on or like like on that matter and it's really, really it really actually does help because i'll tell you something like so many people who came in and because it's largely interest driven like i'll tell you this is fantastic example like we had with two artworks where people got involved and when they started reading the research paper they got so like oh my god there's so much for me to draw here because you know like most of these papers are on fragmentation of a forest or compensatory reforestation or understanding what does a transmission line do to a forest they're like dense rich papers 30 30 40 pages long and you are, you literally have the freedom to pull out maybe just a line that excites you from there or you can pull out an entire statistic that excites you from there and you can make anything of it so first steps first just start getting involved get connected with these people most of these places reply fast they are always looking for volunteers take the energy write an email see how you can get involved and i'm sure there'll be room for everybody in such campaigns at least with the amchamola campaign the bang campaign i know that they are always looking out for artists and there's no cut off timeline so spend maybe you could work on something just every weekend if you're doing a day job and give something after 6 months also and create like an incredible piece we've had students send in animations which was something i never expected because i know the kind of effort in time that goes into making 2d animations but i guess like you know what kalpa saying you know when you have your intentions and honesty in place of course you'll goof up so many times but the work will always show that honesty it's very you know that's but that's one powerful thing about art it's this honesty comes across very fast like you can you can figure it out like this it's very you you cannot fake that intention it always just shows so keep your intentions in place and just get involved <laughs> awesome that was a wonderful answer just one final question it's uh, it's the last one it's for uh, the filmmakers who wait people are very excited about your next project um they're hoping to know when that'll come out or what that will be uh, it's fine if you guys don't have an idea i understand it takes a lot of energy to make a piece of art and then directly go on to the other one is a very difficult task but if you do have the audience is just intrigued if you are working on a project don't have to explain anything else yeah mostly you can't help it can you because uh, so the next <laughs> thing uh, uh, the next thing i'm doing personally is uh, it's an animated feature film it has uh, it's set in amdabad uh, which is where we both studied uh, working on it feature i mean uh, to put it in perspective this 10 and a half minute long film took us 3 and a half years to make <laughs> so if one if one does the unitary <laughs> method or as in obviously one hopes to get more help on board to yeah. like, do it right we've learned a lot on the last project as well so it's an animated feature film called elum and yeah it shall be you know it shall be out into the world soon <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome uh, we're looking forward to it as much as we look i look like i love it i mean i was much <laughs> like i was so i'm so glad that i'm part of all tech to be able to see this um unfortunately i have to end this conversation because um time is a limit that we have to kind of go with but um it was amazing talking to all of you thank you for coming on for this panel and sharing your experiences sharing your intellect and sharing your uh, art i guess and it's it's just been wonderful to have this conversation um i hope to see you guys in person some day and have this yes, conversation for sure absolutely sure. Um, please so <laughs> thank you for having us it really thank you nice. so much it's been so good meeting all of you yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> thanks a lot thanks a lot all right i think we're done okay see you guys see you bye bye all right bye guys <laughs>